My name is Iqbal Malik, I'm a cardiologist in London and I'm going to talk to you about how to put in a pericardial drain. It's a procedure done rarely but when it is needed to drain fluid around the heart the juniors often haven't got enough experience to do it easily and readily so here's how to do it. So step number one is to get the patient positioned at 45 degrees with a bolster cushion in the cardiac catheter lab and be ready with emergency equipment so this patient's being got ready uh, he's not an extremist, but the decision was made to try and put a drain in. Step two is to find out where you might drain it. Position A, uh, next to the bone uh, in the sternum. Position B, under the rib cage, And position C, my favourite, at the apex of the heart. If you can actually see fluid at the apex of the heart, that means there is no lung in the way and it's an easy position to hit. So here's the subcostal position under the rib cage, And you can see the fluid is a black shadow with the heart wobbling in the middle. The problem, of course, is there's that grayish matter above, which is the liver. And so if you're going to try and get a needle into the fluid, you may well hit the liver as well, which is a very vascular organ and could bleed. So in many instances, the, the subcostal view is not the best position. So here's the apical view, my favorite. And again, you can see the heart wobbling in the middle and a big effusion, but this time no big gray shadow in the way because there is no lung in the way. There is no liver in the way, and we found a hole between the ribs to take our echo picture. So this is a much better position, I think, and more comfortable for the patient as well. Um, if we're looking at whether this man is an extremist, then uh, often the right atrial wall, which I marked out, is collapsing, uh, not when it's contracting, but on when it's relaxed. And diastolic collapse is not happening here, but the pressure is a, blood pressure is a bit low, and so the indication was to do a drain. I've marked the spot with my finger because of course the ultrasound is now away and then I'm going to wipe away the jelly and use a marker to position exactly where I am. I'm trying to be just above a rib where there is no blood vessel or nerve, not just below a rib where there is a blood vessel and nerve. The marker often rubs off so as well as putting the marker on, what I'm going to do is once I'm ready with that position, a generous amount of marking, I'm going to use the cap of the marker pen just to indent the skin. If you push in, it leaves an indent in the skin, which you can see is not too painful, uh, but actually means that if the marking rubs off, you'll still be able to see where your needle has to go. So we're going to clean up the whole area. Uh, so uh, warn the patient, it might be a bit cold. Uh, clean up the area, as I say, when you do clean the area, sometimes the marker rubs off. And so that's okay, no problem. Remember, we have that dent as well to tell us where to go. And so we've cleaned up and then we used a great big drape because we don't want to desterilize anything and we certainly don't want to introduce infection to the sac around the heart, the pericardium. So we've used a femoral drape here, which is absolutely massive. And we don't want to cover his head up because that will make him claustrophobic. And so we'll just position it with one of the holes that we use on the femoral artery now being used on the, uh, on the apical area. So as uh, my registrar drapes things up, uh, tucks some of the drapes underneath the chin, uh, we then suddenly see that there is one hole and that is going to be sitting over uh, the target zone uh, on the apex of the heart. And once we've stuck that all down, uh, then we're ready uh, to actually be sure that we're in the right spot still. There's no point in blindly putting um, a needle in. So back with the ultrasound this round, this time around under a sterile cover so that we can see that apical position, we can see the fluid again and the direction of the probe, which is the direction of the ultrasound, is also the direction of the needle. So we take a green needle, so not too traumatic, a green needle with the anaesthetic attached, warn the patient we're going to have a little bee sting and then my registrar is popping in uh, the anaesthetic on the marked position, having felt that we're just above a rib and not just below a rib. And so remember the reason for that, which I'll show you in a second, is that the neurovascular bundle runs just below the rib. And we do not want to be hitting a small artery or a vein or causing pain by actually having uh, the needle attack that spot rather than better to attack this spot, which is just above a rib and away from that important area. So as we infiltrate down, we're going to slowly go deeper and inject, then deeper and inject, 
And eventually as we're pulling back, because each time we push in, we also pull back, we'll see that eventually we'll hit something. And what we're trying to do is get the needle into the pericardial space where there should be fluid, a generous amount of fluid, and not hit the ventricle where there should be also fluid, which will be pulsatile red blood, which would not be a good thing. So once we've infiltrated the skin, sometimes a green needle is enough to bring uh, us into the fluid, but sometimes it's not. So we've infiltrated the tract and then using anesthetic again on the longer needle that comes with the set, and I always use an eight French set rather than a six French set. Again, we're going just above the rib and we're slowly advancing. There's no jerky movements here. The patient's calm, the registrar is calm. And so you can see we've got some red stuff. And so that red stuff hopefully is fluid coming from the pericardial space. Red pericardial fluid always indicates either a nasty infection or cancer um, and, and not pulsatile red blood coming out, which means that you've actually pushed your needle into the left ventricle, which is not going to be a good situation. But as long as it's just a needle and you haven't dilated the track, even if it's the ventricle, you're probably going to get away with it. So we're now feeding the wire into the pericardial space through that needle. You've held the needle very still. You're taking the wire through and once there's a generous amount of wire in, you can then remove your needle. But before we do anything else, we now should scream. A wet swab on the wire just holds it still so we don't have to worry about it flicking about. And we're going to scream. So in comes the x-ray machine without knocking his head. And once we've got the x-ray machine in position, we'll have a quick screen of the wire. and We should, it's, we should see it in a sort of circular position in the pericardial space, which uh, surrounds the whole of the heart. So there's the wire tucked up around in the pericardial space, curling up. So once we're comfortable with that, then we can go back. And what we need to do is to make a generous tract for the drain. At the moment, it's just a needle puncture. So our next move is to make an incision and a small blade. Remember, you've already given anesthetic, so it shouldn't hurt, so that we can dilate up that tract. So we made a nick in the skin. It doesn't need to be too generous. It's only an eight French drain. And once we've done that, uh, then we can get the dilator on. It's important to dilate the tract uh, because otherwise the drain, which is very flimsy, can, uh, can sometimes just buckle up under the skin and not go into the pericardium. Now, the wire is important. The wire was at 90 degrees going in because the needle was at 90 degrees going in. So hold it at 90 degrees to the skin and just advance the dilator while fixing the wire. In a very slim person, it's probably not essential to do this step, but if you've got a more bulky person with some fat on the chest wall, it really is very important to hold the wire so that the dilator is going straight into the pericardium. We do not want it buckling because then the drain certainly will also buckle and you won't get it into the pericardium and you may have to start all over again. So once we've done that, we gently remove the dilator without removing our wire, obviously. And once we've done that, then we can feed on the drain. It's a pigtail catheter, so several holes at the end. And uh, we can see that Chet is feeding things on. Of course, we never let go of a piece of wire. There's a lot of wire inside the pericardium. Therefore, he's fed it back a bit so he can hold it again at 90 degrees to the skin. And then we're going to see if we can just squeeze this through. Now, Chet, at the moment, there we are. Now he's got tension on the wire because before the wire was floppy and so there wasn't much wire support. But now he's got tension on the wire and he's slowly feeding it forward. There shouldn't be very much resistance. And uh, we're then going to uh, screen again. And here's the drain uh, that's gone all the way into the pericardium. So once we've got that, we can attach the bag. And so usually you can put a three-way tap in in between the drain and the bag. And the bottom of the bag uh, has an open close switch. Sometimes that's been left open, so fluid then goes everywhere. So it's important just to click that closed so that the fluid remains in the bag and not on your shoes. And there's the red stuff coming out. And now we're going to drain the suture. So a, a, a drain suture we put under the drain, in the skin, in and out, and then do a double knot that's not very tight on the skin. We don't want to necrose the skin. This drain may be in for 24, 48 hours, but we do want a very tight, firm knot that we can then tie the drain to. So we're going underneath the drain. Uh, we've got a hold of the suture. We'll do a double knot 
and uh, we can basically take the needle off. The needle is not really needed anymore because we're then going to do a, a Roman sandal affair on the drain, uh, a drain suture to hold things in position, which doesn't require a further needle. So uh, here's my double knot coming in. And once we've done that double knot, we can draw it down towards the skin. So that's two knots, and then we're going to try and plait. So that plait means that we're going under and over, under and over. So we're beginning here. One switcher goes and we knot, and then we go under and over again. So I'm doing a double knot at the moment, and then we'll do the under and over. Okay, and once we've done that, then we need to take all the drapes off. So we detach, there's a three-way tap there, so nothing's happening. Uh, we can take away the ultrasound probe, it doesn't fall on the floor, that's an expensive mistake if that hits the floor. And we're keeping everything very sterile. So we've removed uh, all the drapes. And then I've cut some uh, swabs. So there's a, a cut to the middle of the swab. One goes underneath, as you can see, and another one goes over. So I'm trying to produce a cushion for the entry point, not only to keep it sterile and away from bugs, but also meaning that there's no nasty sudden right angle bend in the drain uh, to cause a problem. So now we can just reattach the drain and the final stage is to make a sandwich, a sandwich of tegaderm so that we can keep everything sterile and have no infection that could possibly enter. So I've got a tegaderm there and the first one I'm going to fold in half and have the sticky side downwards. I've stuck it to the skin and the swabs, but the sticky side that's on the drain I'm keeping in the air at the moment. I've not stuck that down firmly. I'll take another one and repeat the process, but this time join up those free in the air sticky sides. So the drain is going to be wrapped a little bit so it's not in the tension. And you can see that what I've done is stuck to the skin, trapped the swabs, and now I've got in the middle a sandwich that actually takes the drain. So once we remove all of these uh, tapes on the tegaderm, uh, we end up with the sandwich in position and usually I'll do one extra uh, extra tegaderm on top just to be ultra secure. It's important to take all these bits of paper off because if the papers are on they can sometimes pull the tegaderm off. Once the papers are off it's very unlikely you're going to pull the tegaderm off. And it's worth taking some time because this is part of keeping it sterile. It's not really holding it in position although tegaderm is pretty sticky and uh, so it shouldn't pull out now but we can see that now that's a nice a safe tidy position and one more tegaderm on top if you really fancy uh, just to give it even extra safety so i've taken all the tags out of the way the defib pads are out of the way and uh, the final tegaderm has gone on so uh, to summarize then uh, we've been at 45 degrees we've talked calmly to the patient we have found the right position on ultrasound, marked it with both the marker pen and the top of the marker pen. We've then made sure that we've gone above a rib space, not, not below a rib space. Ultrasound checked again, uh, stuck a needle in uh, and then put the wire in, checked the wire position, uh, then put the drain in, checked that the red stuff is not clotting because pericardial fluid does not clot and we are then ready to say samples to the lab to make a diagnosis. Thanks for watching.